Professor Lee, it's it's great to have you back with us um, again in, again in a virtual space. Unfortunately, I hope one day we will also have you face to face in one of our events. It's good to good to have you. You are you're known as a as a strategist with extensive global academic and research experience. You've served on government and academic committees across the U.S., Europe, and Latin America, including science advisories for NASA and ESA. At Harvard, you held numerous positions, including as uh, executive director for education and research, and before that, as professor for astrophysics. Your focus has shifted since towards research and education innovation programs tar targeting the sustainable development goals. It's good to have you, and we're looking forward to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Greetings, everybody, from the United States uh, here in Boston. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to speak. So I'm gonna to attempt to give a very broad brush overview of the leaky pipeline in the global context and offer some of my own thoughts and uh, conjectures uh, for intervention, which uh, I think many is in line with what um, the esteemed uh, assistant um, deputy minister have just spoken about. Um, so my, my background is in astrophysics and I'm a career academic. So just to give reference to the complexity that is this issue and to acknowledge the, um, the digital economy that is actually driving industry 4.0, I wanted to represent the leaky uh, pipeline in the context of a network of circuits. So to make the analogy then very much the same way that we could connect these nodes of networks, nodes to actually enhance or impede performance in very much the same way, we can actually maybe think about these nodes as space, time, or interventions that will enhance or impede um, um, a female's ability to succeed in STEM. So in 2018, the World Economic Forum uh, published this landscape report on jobs. And what it's saying is that the global economy and industry 4.0 needs increasingly STEM workers. Um, and that in fact, there's more skilled jobs and there, uh, there's more jobs and they're actually skilled workers. And unfortunately, these are typically very stereotypically male dominated field jobs. They're also jobs that require a lot more education. So there's a lot more upfront necessity in terms of investment in education to get the return. But I think the return is very key uh, in terms of prosperity for the individual, for the companies and also for nations. And just as a other note is when, when women are actually in the workforce, it's also well known that the GDP increases. Unfortunately, on the reverse, um, the declining jobs that are in, at high risk for automation are very highly represented um, by females and minorities. So the question is, how can we actually both increase STEM jobs, but really also increase STEM jobs um, for um, women working in that workforce? So there's a lot here, but basically the point that I wanted to make is that there are really well-known gender barriers that we're all familiar with. And I know these three key points is something I wanna to touch on in this particular talk. But one thing that pervades all of these issues is that as we go across uh, from the pre-K level all the way to the STEM workplace, things that consistently come up are stereotypes about what girl versus boy roles are and the lack of appropriate female mentorship and of course, when you actually get into the professional stage, there is uh, women face what is also known as a motherhood uh, penalty. So I wanna actually spend some time um, on the pre-K 12 um, stage. Um, I, this is really very critical for setting fundamentals. Uh, in fact, there's studies done that have shown that pre-primary is getting increasingly important for setting fundamentals uh, for success in the future. Um, so there's great need for investment in human capital uh, and there's a lot of you know, studies that have shown that education quality and student performance um, track very strongly with investment in the education itself. And STEM as a field, is particularly in the digital age, uh, requires a lot of comparatively costly investments uh, upfront. And at the most basic levels is investments in infrastructures. We take internet for granted, but in fact, in a lot of the world, um, that is not really a, a resource. And even as early, and, and the pandemic has certainly shown us that that is really key, right, to the access to education. Um, and and um, in fact, internet was seen as so important that the UN declared that it would be a human right back in 2016. And certainly if we're talking about computation, we really also need to think about uh, access to equipment and resources as well. Um, so in terms of that, um, I think in terms of resources, clearly we actually need very capable STEM 
uh, teachers to teach, and then a very good mentors and role models. One can argue that if you had good infrastructure and access in place, that you can leverage online courses from all around the world um, that, that teach to kids and teach to adults as well. Something that's actually been quite a lot um, on my mind is that um, STEM fields require lots of critical and analytical thinking. So something that's been on my, my mind is whether or not strategy games such as chess and others need to actually also be uh, included in, in education. And, and just to put that out there, something that I've also been thinking about is whether music is also a useful supplement uh, for um, improving STEM skills. I mean, often math and music skills have been linked. A lot of you know, scientists are also very uh, good musicians, although that, that is debated. That said, there has been very promising brain research on music that's coming out, that has come out that shows really interesting cognitive development when, when kids actually learn music at a very early stage. The other uh, aspect I wanted to touch upon is really cultural norms and stereotypes um, at the pre-K to 12 level. I, I, for me, I think this is an absolute critical um, you know, stage uh, of education. So the OCD and PISA, uh, PISA actually did a very significant uh, study that showed that there was no significant differences in STEM abilities between boys and girls um, at the early stages. And in fact, if anything, girls who start school are more committed to studies. Um, and unfortunately, when given a choice, uh, girls are still disadvantaged. If you actually have to send a girl versus a boy to school, um, most of the time it would be the boy that is, is chosen. Uh, luckily, I was actually very pleased to see that uh, most countries are at gender parity with, uh, with respect to gender, um, with respect to gender uh, primary enrollment. So, but that's still good. Uh, so the so my conjectures for changing cultural expectations um, is is possibly controversial, but I wonder if we can actually take strategies from behavioral economics and be able to implement some kind of subtle behavior nudges to break stereotypes. So moving on to um, the tertiary university education, this is very key for skill building. Um, we're very close to parity, it's nice to see in terms of university education and even graduate school up to almost the PhD level uh, in, in, and in fields in humanities and sciences. What you will see though is unfortunately there's a huge gross underrepresentation in the fields of STEM and math, physics, engineering. And if you can see in the, in the left plot here that um, even if we're actually at parity between girls and boys, that as you get to successively higher levels of education and career, you have a, a, a precipitous drop off in terms of um, gender parity. The other conjecture I would say is that, you know, how will we go about targeting support structures to increase female teachers at the higher levels? As you can see here from this UNESCO um, Institute for Statistics study, just over a 20 year period, you'll see that the percentage of women teachers across the world and different nations is consistently um, lowered as you go to increasingly higher education levels. So at the primary to tertiary level, you have a significantly significant drop in, um, in women teachers. And yet this is, this is significant because women will want to be looking for uh, women role models. The other conjecture I have is, will something as simple as rebranding work? So in a case study that was in fact done by uh, Eindhoven several years ago, what they did was they kept their engineering degrees the same, but all they did was they actually rebranded re, um, re it. So instead of saying that the engineering course, engineering degree is very technology focused and, and, and things that, you know, terms that would normally appeal to the males, what they did was they actually uh, re, um, what they do was they actually cast it to, to be engineering as a tool to solve social problems. And in that context, what happened is that they ended up getting a significant increase in female enrollments. The other thing I wanted to mention is I think what we teach also matters a lot. Um, so with the exponential rise of AI, where uh, deep learning and machine learning is really getting to the level of mimicking how the brain actually makes decisions, this is my own assessment of where we are at with AI of, uh, and, and how it compares to our own uh, computational power. 
In terms of you know, evolving something from simple to complex, I think the machines win. Uh, I think we're very close now between in, in terms of the innovation space with what AI can do versus what we can do. I think where we actually win out and will probably always win out is where is, is the invention part and how we can create from scratch. So I think this is in line with um, the World Economic Forum Future of uh, Jobs Report. Um, so employers are looking less for particular types of degrees. What they're looking at are very specific skill sets, complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and things like that. I would add that given the rise of AI, that what we also need to really be thinking about in you know, what we're teaching is, is really ethics in terms of really how to think about all the um, automation that is happening um, and, and how do we actually use our skills to navigate really critical problems that are happening in the world. So on the left here, this is a quite complicated figure, but basically what it's showing is that across different parts of the world and for different um, fields, this is the, the women representation in these particular fields. It's very interesting and nice to see that in fact, in many of the fields, particularly medical health sciences that were really uh, at parity uh, and these others as well, what is also still a gross underrepresentation is, is of course the STEM field. So even if you include the, the fields at parity with um, the STEM fields, what you get overall is that globally researchers, uh, women only make up about 33%. It's nice to see that um, you know, Central Asia and some Latin American countries are in fact reaching parity. What is very, very poor is of course the engineering technology and the sciences. And then when you look at the minorities within that, it's, it's less than 6%. It's really quite bad and atrocious. Um, and in the national academies, certainly the female representation is at very, very low levels. Um, so, um, you know, and, and certainly women in academics or elsewhere, there is something known as the motherhood penalty where, um, you know, they're, they're women significantly drop out after that. In, in, a, in, in a study that was actually done um, some years ago by um, Harvard, what they did was they surveyed about a thousand um, women who actually left the field and asked why they left the field. And many of the answers that came up are really consistent, I think, across academics, across corporate, and that there's no advancement, too many hours, there's an issue with work-life integration, there's hostile culture, uh, sexual harassment, all this stuff. And you can see that, in fact, there's a there's a significant decline in terms of uh, female representation from entry level to, to corporate. So just uh, my oversimplified conjectures in summary is that at all stages, I think we need to really think about how we might really do get a cultural shift away from stereotypes. How do we actually bring in more uh, female role models and, and encouragement? But the, the point being that we really need to start very, very early to build up the confidence and the belief in self-worth of girls uh, so that they can uh, success, be successful in STEM fields. Um, and, and certainly, I think it's very, very critical that we invest in education. Often that's one of the first things to be cut. And I think by the time that right, women make it in the careers, the workplace retention is, is, is very key, but you would have actually invested so much in the early stages. We need to really think about how do you actually also support and retain women there. So just to end uh, with, um, you know, maybe a cartoon is, right, I think, you know, we, we've had females actually be assessed by, by male standards. And, you know, independent of that, my question to you is that the world is fundamentally changing. So are the metrics that have worked before work now? And so I wanna, before I end, I want to really kind of, um, you know, zoom back out into um, what, what is important. I think we have to question that it's important to study STEM, but what are we studying STEM for? How can we leverage industry 4.0? And I would say that there is critical needs in the world and in and, 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 and solving a number of these uh, SDG issues. And with that, I, I thank you.